Today's episode of the Time Rune Sports Show, or if you call it an episode, will be different. We'll not be talking about three different things or something special, including high school sports. Instead, this will be a documentary about this new idea that I came up with. It is, right there on your screen, The Curse of Jim Brown. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably scratching your head and saying, Tommy, how could the greatest Cleveland Brown of all time place a curse on his own team? Well, once the special is over, you'll understand that once Jim Brown left, so did all the talent and glory of the Cleveland Browns. So, without further interruptions, let's dive into this unheard of curse, which is true, because I researched it, and the script, 15 pages long. It's not 15 pages for nothing. Let's go. Now, I don't have to mention to all of you who Jim Brown is. He's without a doubt the greatest player in Cleveland Browns history and arguably the greatest running back of all time. A member of the NFL 100 team, he retired as the all-time leader in rushing yards and rushing touchdowns, which have since been broken. But during his time, the Cleveland Browns never had a losing season and reached the NFL championship on three occasions. While they lost to Detroit when Brown was a rookie in 1957 and 1964, Cleveland took down the heavy favorite Baltimore Colts by a score of 27-0. The next year, Cleveland was back in the NFL championship game where they would play the Green Bay Packers. Despite holding a 9-7 lead at one point, the Browns fell apart and lost 23-12 at Lambeau as the Packers would celebrate as champions of the world. Then... The unexpected happened. In July of 1966, while in London and on set to film The Dirty Dozen, Jim Brown shocked all the NFL when he announced his retirement at the age of 30 to become an actor. He had just won MVP the year before, was the leading rusher at the time, and seemingly hadn't peaked yet. While well, he was a successful actor, and Cleveland still loves him. Well, did anybody know that as he retired, a curse on his beloved team. The 1966 season was successful as Cleveland went 9-5. The Browns found a good tandem to replace Jim Brown with Leroy Kelly and Ernie Green, with both having over 750 yards to make it the Pro Bowl. However, they tied for second place with the Philadelphia Eagles in the NFL East and failed to make the playoffs. It was a major disappointment as the Browns had a great quarterback with Frank Ryan and a great wide receiver with Gary Collins. In 1967, the Browns moved to the newly created and shortly lived century division due to the Falcons and Saints joining the NFL. With four teams in the division, Cleveland went 9-5 once again, but was good enough to win the division. Unfortunately, in the divisional round, they got spanked to Dallas, 52-14. Missing out on the Super Bowl yet again. The next season... Cleveland once again won the division as Leroy led the NFL in rushing yards for the second year in a row and touchdowns for the third year. With the new quarterback named Bill Nelson, they were able to beat Dallas in the NFL divisional round, but then came the Colts. In the NFL championship game with a bid to Super Bowl three on the line, Baltimore got revenge on the 1964 NFL championship game by beating those Cleveland Browns by a score of 34 to nothing and the right to play the New York Jets where Joe Namath guaranteed his Super Bowl victory. In 1969, the Browns won the Century Division for the third and final year of its existence with a 10-3-1 record. After once again beating Dallas in the divisional round, they fell to the Minnesota Vikings for their first and to date only NFL championship by a score of 27 to seven. It was the third time in the last five years the Browns lost the NFL championship game. And it would be the last time Cleveland has ever played a game with such an honor on the line. Also that year, the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl with Len Dawson being the quarterback of that team. The very first sign of the fact that Jim Brown may have cursed us. Not just, I'm not kidding. He didn't. My curse us. He did. Because for the second time in four years, the Browns moved divisions thanks to the AFL NFL merger. They would join the AFC division with the Steelers, Bengals, and Oilers. However, with a new division, 
The Browns went 7-7 seven in seven, 1970 with a three-game losing streak midway through this season and failing to make the playoffs as Paul Warfield was in Miami. Blanton Collier, the second coach in Browns history, was fired following that season. Nick Scorich took over as the head coach for the Browns and rallied them from a 4-5 start to win their last five games, finishing 9-5 to win the division. Then in the divisional round, the Colts, a black cat to the Browns franchise since 1964. After 1964, easily beat Cleveland at the mistake by the lake, 20-3. In 1972, the Browns finished on an 8-1 run to finish 10-4, but did not win the division due to an upstart Steelers team finishing 11-3. In the divisional round, the Browns held a 14-13 lead in the fourth quarter, but lost 20-14 to due to a Dolphins team who would finish with a perfect record. The only team with a perfect record since the AFL-NFL merger. As noted by that block punt, that loss marked the end of an air in Cleveland. The 1973 season started off 7-3-1 with a big win against Pittsburgh at home, but all fell apart from there. They finished 0-2-1, third in the AFC Central, failing to make the playoffs. If 1973 was a disappointment, then 74 was a failure. Cleveland never caught on fire and finished 4-10, their first losing season since 1956. Nick Scorwich was fired after that season. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have to interrupt this documentary to bring you this picture. This picture represents all the evil, stinginess, greed, and anger that all of Cleveland is still cursing about. That man is Art Modell. What you're going to see throughout the 1970s and 1995 are all evil and dirty works of, the wor of one of the worst owners in the history of football. Let me give you a backstory. From the beginning in 1946 to 61, the Browns were dubbed as the Yankees of football, being the team to beat. Paul Brown was the genius behind them, taking them to the AAFC slash NFL championship game in their first 10 seasons. Otto Graham was a quarterback in all those seasons and retired as the greatest quarterback in the NFL's then short history. And many people still claim he's the best even 100 years from the NFL's creation. Not just that, but Paul Brown was also a racial pioneer and a civil rights advocate, with Miriam Motley and Bill Willis being two of the first four black players in NFL history. When most coaches and GMs would pass on players due to their skin color, Brown welcomed them and allowed careers like Motley and Jim Brown to happen. Not just that, but he would also sit next to them, talk with them, and try to make them even better. He was way ahead of his time, and is saluted for that work, which is very good for him. This all happened due to the good friendship between the owner Arthur McBride and Jim Brown. McBride would deal with money and finances while Brown dealt with the team. Then, on one fateful day in 1961, McBride sold the team to the evil Art Modell. He had a poor relationship with Paul Brown, whose relationship with the players was also deteriorating. One of those players leading that pack, Jim Brown. With both sides angry at him, the Browns fell to 8-5-1 in 1961. Modell and Brown's relationship got worse when Paul Brown traded away Bobby Mitchell to Washington for Ernie Davis, another Syracuse running back who was supposed to be the next Jim Brown. Modell was not aware of it until a phone call, and he was not happy about the trade. Then, when Ernie Davis was dying of leukemia, Modell urged Brown to start him before he died, but Brown refused to, thinking that he'd get worse. With the fiasco going on, the Browns went 7-6-1, and one, and Brown was fired. The man who was literally the face of the team for their entire history was taken away by a dictator of an owner. While Modell was being a tyrant with this decision, one might say this was Jim Brown's doing, or his relationship with the coach was getting worse and worse. Then in 1966, it was Jim and Modell who were fighting. As mentioned at the top of the documentary, Brown was overseas to fight the, or to film the Dirty Dozen. Modell was losing his patience on Jim Brown to get back, and being the greedy dictator he was, he was fighting Brown until he came back to High Rome for training camp. So then after getting into a dispute with said owner, 
Brown left Cleveland and announced his retirement. So you might be wondering how all this has to do with Jim Brown cursing the team. Well, it's simple. Brown, in a way, cursed Cleveland by firing their bluff head coach. And once he retired from the NFL, he placed a curse on Cleveland for their bad ownership of the team and the direction they were going in. Aren't Modell taking over as the owner? The Browns may have been put under a bad sign because Jim Brown was in his prime. And then, once he left, everything was all falling apart. Aren't Modell owning Cleveland may have been shown a curse by Jim Brown. The rest of the 1970s saw the Browns as a lowly team that had very few things to be happy about. They only had two winning seasons from 1975 to 79, never finished above third place in the Central. Forrest Craig was fired after a decent 9-5 season, which might be a tribute to Jim Brown's curse. I was one of the three coaches in that five-year span. Despite all this negativity going on, 1979 Joe Promise, the Browns got off to a 4-0 start and ended the season 9-7 with two of their wins in overtime and all but two by seven points or less. Sipe threw for nearly 4,000 yards and 20 touchdowns while he was at it. Mike Pruitt cracked the 1,000-yard mark while Dave Logan, Ozzie Newsom, and Reggie Rucker all proved to be good targets for Brian Sipe. Maybe, just maybe, this team was going places. 1980 was the year that gave Cleveland optimism for the first time since the 1960s. Brian Seif threw for over 4,000 passing yards at a 60.3 completion percentage, 30 touchdowns, and 14 INTs, all while winning MVP. Pro once again ran for over 1,000 yards, and Calvin Hill had six receiving touchdowns. Cleveland won 11-5 and five after an 0-2 start, with nine of their wins being by seven points or less. The Cardiac Kids, as they were known. They won the division on the last game of the season on a Don Cockroft field goal. And they will be playing the winner of the wild card game, which would be that Oakland Raiders team on your screen. The Browns took a 6-0 lead after that pick six you just saw by Ron Bolton. And the score became 7-6 Oakland at halftime. Cleveland then took a 12-7 lead after two Don Cockroft field goals. But the Oakland Raiders scored a touchdown and it became 14 to 12 Oakland. After stomping Oakland from pulling the game on ice, the Browns had the ball at their own 15 and got inside the red zone. It looked like everything was gonna happen. The Browns got to Oakland's 13 yard line with just a minute to play. As that handoff to Mike Pruitt just seemed to be it. Everybody thought the Browns were just gonna kill clock let it just die and let Don Cockroft kick the game-winning field goal and all would be happy. But nope, none of that happened. Instead, an infamous play known as Red Right 88 happened. On second and nine, Sipe looked to throw for a go-ahead touchdown, but his pass to Ozzie Newsom was intercepted by Mike Davis in the end zone and the Raiders would win the game and the Super Bowl. A great season was over unexpectedly, and the next year would not be nice for Cleveland. In 1981, the Browns finished with a 1-7 ending and a 5-11 record less than the AFC Central, not to mention Forrest Gregg was now with the Bengals, and he took them to their very first Super Bowl. The next season, they had a 4-5 record in a strike shortened season, but didn't make the playoffs due to the fact that because of a strike, there were eight teams rather than six, or at the time, five, I should say. So, despite that, they lost to the Raiders yet again by a score of 27-7. 1983, Cleveland ended up 9-7, and seven, but it was not good enough for the playoffs. And 1984 was once again yet another disaster. Sam Ritigliano was fired midway through a disastrous 5-11 and 11 season. The dream dynasty that was envisioned in 1980 was gone. The Browns had fallen from grace and were not the same. However, things were about to change. The 1985 NFL Draft had the Browns draft Bernie Kosar and Kevin Mack. These two players were supposed to be the faces of the franchise with Kosar right there, Q being the team and Mack being the running back. Although they had an 8-8 record, their draft picks paid off as they won the division. In the divisional round, the Browns held a 21-3 lead over the Dolphins in the third quarter, only to see it fall apart. Thanks to two touchdowns by Rod Davenport, Miami won 24-21 to advance to the AFC Championship game. 
The 1986 season was one of the best seasons the Browns had in years. Kosar threw for 3,854 yards with 17 touchdowns and 10 INTs. The defense was anchored by Clay Matthews, Mike Johnson, Frank Minifield, and Hanford Dixon. This led to a 12-4 record and the right to play the Jets in the divisional game. Though they were down 20-10, Cleveland would rally, scoring 10 points, and they would force overtime. And then it went to double overtime when Mark Mosley kicked the game-winning field goal, giving them the win. It's one of the very few games that went into double overtime in the history of football. As Mosley lined up for the winning field goal right there. Then came the Denver Broncos after that game-winning field goal. In what was a back-and-forth game, Cleveland held a 20-13 lead and pinned Denver at their own two with 5.32 to go. Then John Elway worked his magic to create the infamous drive. He would take them 98 yards on 15 plays in a five-minute span. The Broncos never faced fourth down, convert on third and 18, and tied the game on a touchdown pass from Elway to Mark Jackson. This forced overtime as Denver punched the ticket to the Super Bowl thanks to a big field goal by Rich Carlos, the barefooted kicker. It was the closest the Browns got in nearly 20 years, all while Jim Brown, the man who cursed us in the first place, watched. The 87 season had the Browns go 10-5, and five, good enough to win the division with most of the key players having a major role. However, in the championship game, this infamous play happened. They were a few yards away when Ernest Beiner got the ball. Looked like he was going to score and then fumbles the ball where Denver was to pick it up. The Browns were only seven yards away from tying the game, but instead Ernest Beiner would fumble it. There would be no overtime. There would be nothing. And instead Denver would be on their way to the Super Bowl for the second year in a row. It was absolute heartbreak in all of Cleveland. And the ironic part, Beiner was a running back like Jim Brown and wouldn't peak until he went to Washington a few years later and won the Super Bowl. I really don't think that's a coincidence that he got better. It was a curse. In 1988, the Browns finished 10 and 6, but kept it with the wild card thanks to the Bengals winning division. While Cleveland kept it close, they fell apart in the wild card game in the Houston Oilers and lost 24-23. When it was over, Marsh Schoenheimer was fired by the Houston Oil, or by <laughs> Art Modell for not taking Cleveland's Super Bowl. With him fired, the Browns went with Bud Carson, their new coach, and they went 9-6-1 and to win the AFC Central. However, instead of a big win, it was heartbreak, huge heartbreak. The Browns found themselves at one point down 24-7 and lost 37-21. When the game was over, it signaled the end of the Browns' powerhouse era. The 1990 season, however, was pretty unfortunate. It saw the Browns go 3-13, and all while most of the players got old and past their prime. Bud Carson was fired midway through the season. Jim Schofer was fired after the season. And after then, 1991, the Browns won 6-10, and 10, third in the division. Saw Bernie Kosar, Reggie Langhorne, Brian Brennan, Webster Slaughter leave the team after the season. Also, the new head coach for the Browns was Bill Belichick, and the defensive coordinator was Nick Saban, those two guys on the screen. Yeah, nothing happened to them. Yeah, absolutely nothing. <laughs> or did it? We will see. But in 1992-93, with those two coaches, they went back-to-back 7-9 -back and nine with Kevin Mack leaving the sinking ship after 1992 and the Browns going through Mike Tomzak and Vinny Testaverde as the quarterback. Excuse me, I have to interrupt this documentary yet again. Hold everything, hold everything. That picture that was shown just a few seconds ago, we're going to show it again because after playing from 1932-33 and again from 37-1945, or at night, and then for nearly 50 years, the Cleveland Indians were finally leaving the falling apart trash dump known as the Mistake by the Lake and ain't the beautiful Jacobs Field. Not just that, but the Cavaliers were leaving the remote Richfield Coliseum so they could play at the Gund Arena, which was the first time in nearly, or in 20 years, 
that the Cavs would be playing in downtown Cleveland. Just so they were in a more convenient spot and right where everybody could watch them. Also during this time, Art Modell's lease on the mistake by the lake was coming to an end and refused to have a stadium built with a Jake and gun due to him thinking that he had enough money. However, after the tribe left Municipal, the Browns money was declining sharply as they lost $21 million by the end of the 1994 season. Now that that's been mentioned, we need to get back to the story. Because the 1994 team saw them going right back to the late 80s teams as Leroy Howard proved to be a capable running back and Vinny Testaverde was a good quarterback. They would go 11-5, second in the AFC Central. In the wild card game, the Browns won 2013 over the Patriots, unbeknownst to the fans that Bill Belichick would eventually coach this team and it would be the last time the Browns ever won a playoff game. And at Pittsburgh, the Browns were annihilated 29-9 and would not make the AFC Championship game. Then the 1995 season was looking good for the Browns as they had a chance to become a Super Bowl team for the first time ever. Oh, was it exciting. They got off to a 4-4 four four start and beat the Bengals in overtime. The next week on November the 5th, they were crushed by the Oilers 3710. But it wasn't as close to the heartbreak that came the next day. By this time, Art Modell was tired of the city and was desperate to build the new stadium. He asked to save for $175 million, equivalent to 300 mil today, in tax to renovate the declining Cleveland Municipal Stadium or a new stadium. Modell was convinced that the city was against him for making a new stadium or trying to fix it. Then, on November 6, 1995, came a day I like to call the day the real Browns died. In downtown Baltimore, Art Modell, a man who wrecked the glory of the Browns and turned the team into a heartbreak, announced that they were leaving Cleveland for good. They would be heading to Baltimore, who had been without an NFL franchise since 1984. The next day, which was election day, the city approved Modell's deal of making a new stadium. But by this time, Modell refused to. He wanted to get out of Cleveland. The Browns tanked. The attendance died. Local sponsors just pulled everything. Everything was all gone to pressure the evil tyrant into keeping the Browns. However, all this failed, and the last game, which was Black Down Channel 3, was filled with angry fans who threatened to riot, something that could be considered worse than what happened in Oakland back in December during the Raiders' last game. The Browns won 26-10, to but in the end, their final season ever in Cleveland was a 5-11 record and a one-way ticket to Baltimore. This was it. The last glimpse of happiness and optimism were gone. All the reasons to be a Browns fan and love the NFL were thrown out the window. The Cleveland Browns were no longer the Cleveland Browns. Instead, they were this new team called the Baltimore Ravens. Art Modell was a clown and a jerk. After years of one winning season after another, he blew the team apart in the 70s had them choke in the 80s, and moved them in 1995. He ruined everything good about the Browns, got everybody off the bandwagon, and laughed as he watched us suffer. How? How do we get such a demon as our owner? Why did he make all these awful moves? Jim Brown, that's how. Their relationships with Paul Brown got fired in the first place which snowballed into Modell becoming a tyrant. His relationship with Brown caused him to retire in the first place. And as a result of Modell being an absolute Scrooge, Jim Brown cursed the team of never winning again. He cursed them with bad luck, missing out on the Super Bowl on numerous occasions and the move to Baltimore. He was fed up with what Art Modell had done to the team in the 60s and his frustration with the curmudgeon made him move the team. So in case if you've known, I've been firing a lot of shots at Art Modell. So you might be wondering, why isn't this the curse of Art Modell? Simple. In the 1960s, the Browns were winning. They were winning, winning, winning. And then when Jim Brown left, the Browns found themselves declining. It's no coincidence. However, in 1999, as you see right there, the city of Cleveland was getting a brand new football team. 
a brand new stadium called Cleveland Browns Stadium. Filled on the mistake by the lake as the Browns became an expansion team. The team's rich history, colors, and pride was still there. The city was rejuvenated. In front of a crowd of over 70,000, the Browns were going to play their first game ever. It was a disaster. They lost big time, 43-0. Mike Tomczak, who played quarterback for the Browns just a few years earlier, went 8-for-8 eight eight with the 78 yards and two touchdowns. It was a really frustrating day for the Browns, and that would be a recurring theme the entire season. The 1999 Browns finished 2-14 with two of their wins being a Touchdown, Hail Mary from Tim Couch against New Orleans, and a last-second field goal by Phil Dawson against the Saints. In 2000, the Browns dropped 2-1 and one with back-to-back -back wins against the Bengals and Steelers, but then they lost all but one of their games to finish 3-13. and 13. And that man you saw a few seconds ago, Chris Palmer, was fired. Also, 2000 is pretty notable because the Baltimore Ravens made playoffs for the first time ever since we all came. Their defense was stacked with Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, Jamie Sharper, Rod Burnett, and so much more. They shut out four teams and finished with a 12-4 and four record and second place in the AFC Central. They beat Denver, Tennessee, and Oakland in the playoffs to reach the Super Bowl for the first time ever. However, they destroyed the New York Giants 34-7. Oh, well, Art Modell laughed as he ripped off Cleveland. And while Ozzie and Newsom built the team in the first place, the man behind it, you know who, Jim Brown. He forgave Art Modell for fighting with the team when he moved them to Baltimore and he allowed Ozzie Newsom to become the general manager. He allowed all this happen to Baltimore while continuing to curse his beloved Browns for coming back. The 2001 season was highlighted by that highlight you saw just a few seconds ago, Bottlegate. The Browns were a few yards away when they spiked the ball, and then they reviewed the play because there was a controversy over whether Quincy Morgan caught it or not, even though it's illegal, too, because the Browns got a playoff quicker. What happened? They overturned it. The fans got livid, threw bottles on the field, nearly caused the game to end, but however, the refs, after taking cover for the locker room, fearing their lives, came back, ran those last two plays. It made the fan base look ugly as they nearly killed the referees. Also, that same season, M. Vinteri kicked that game-winning field goal to give the Patriots their very first Super Bowl ever. Yeah, just to mention something, Bill Belichick was the coach of that team. Yeah, you know, Bill Belichick, and also, the Browns selected Spurgeon win in the sixth round 2000 NFL draft. 60 picks later, this guy named Tom Brady was selected. And Tom Brady was the quarterback of that team and led those Patriots to the Super Bowl. The first game of 2002 started off on the wrong foot. Down 39-37, the Chiefs need a miracle to win and tried a multilateral play. It looked like the Browns were going to stop them. But Dwayne Rudd forgot what football was about and threw his helmet in celebration before the game was over. One of the dumbest moves you can ever think of. He was flagged for unsportsmanlike conduct, and Morton Anderson kicked the game-winning field goal for the Chiefs, winning 43-9. It wasn't all bad, though, because the Browns won. That's right, they won 9-7. They made the wild card. It was the first time they were ever making the playoffs it's coming back, and it's been the only time it has happened in their history. And they held a 27-14 lead at one point. Everything was looking good, but the Steelers scored 22 points in the fourth quarter and won 36-33. It would be a fluke as the Browns never made the playoffs again, or Jim Brown cursed them when they played Pittsburgh in the playoffs. And that's as simple as you can get it. Goodwin had optimism for 2003 after making the playoffs the year before. They showed promise with a 3-3 three and three start with a route over Pittsburgh on Sunday night in Cleveland, but every good thing must come to an end. The Browns lost all their last two games to finish 5-11. and 11. Also, when it was over, Tim Couch left after five seasons, making his case for being one of the first picks, or one of the worst first picks of all time. <coughs> Sorry, you need to mention something that's been bugging me. The quarterback jersey. 
Here is everybody on that list. Tim Couch, Ty Detmer, Spurgeon Wing, Doug Peterson, Spur or Kelly Holcomb, Jeff Garcia, Luke McCown, Trent Dilfer, Charlie Fly, Derek Anderson, Brady Quinn, Ken Dorsey, Bruce Skrikowski, Colt McCoy, Jake DeLome, Sanka Walsh, Brandon Wynn, Thad Lewis, Jason Campbell, Brian Hoyer, Johnny Mansell, Connor Shaw, Josh McCown, Aston Davis, Cody Kessler, RG3, Jack Kaiser, Kevin Hogan, Tyrod Taylor, and finally Baker Mayfield. The Browns have broke through an incredible 30 quarterbacks in 21 seasons. And only Tim Couch and Baker Mayfield have had the only two quarterbacks that started all 16 games in one season. All this can be attributed to Jim Brown. Like, who else? 2004 saw the Browns going 3-3 three and three again with Jeff Garcia as their new quarterback. However, as I like to say, all good things in Cleveland must die. The <laughs> Browns dropped nine in a row, fired Butch Davis after 11 games, and saw Terry Robisky to their very first African-American coach of all time, but it was a 4-12 record. Jeff Garcia was cut after the season and was one of the worst free agent signings in NFL history. In 2005, the Browns won 6-10, and in 2006, they went 4-12, continuing their downhill trend. What was changing? 2007, the Browns found themselves fighting for the playoffs. Eric Anderson had a 56.5 completion percent with 3,787 yards and 29 touchdowns. Jamal Lewis rushed for 1,304 yards and 9 touchdowns, while Kellen Winslow Jr. and Braylon Edwards had over 1,000 receiving yards. Their high-scoring shootout that was shown a little while ago against the Bengals and the snowball against Buffalo remain today as Cleveland Classics. All this left to a 10-6 record, and they still didn't make the playoffs. That's right, the Steelers won the AFC North and the Jaguars and Titans had a better record. Oh, how unfortunate is that. Also, Belichick had the Patriots, albeit having an 18-1 season, went 16-0. The only team that's ever done that since the 16-game schedule. And the 2008 season showed that the Browns had fluked yet again. They got off to an 0-3 start and lost their final six games with a 4-12 record. Jamal Lewis did well again with over 1,000 yards, but the Browns went through four starting quarterbacks, and nobody had over 1,000 yards. Also, Romeo Cornell was fired, and they hired Eric Mangini as a head coach. Cleveland got off to a poor 1-11 start with Mangini, but won their final four games in 2009 and ended with a 5-11 season. Not just that, but Nick Saban won his very first title. And Alabama National Championship is first of five so far and has made a case for being one of the greatest college football quarterbacks of all time. Jim Brown once again gave somebody a second chance and he made the most of it. The 2010 season was highlighted by Payton Hillis running wild over the Patriots in a crazy 34-14 victory over the big dynasty. This was part of a 4-2 and two run that gave Cleveland a 5-7 and seven record. But then they lost all their next four games, including a 49-1 massacre against Pittsburgh to finish 5-11. Mangini was fired after a 10-11 campaign over two seasons, and the Browns were yet again looking for a new head coach and quarterback. Before the 2011 season, something good happened for the Browns, though. It was really good. Peyton Hillis got the cover of Man 12, the very first Cleveland Browns to do that, and only one so far. There's Man 12 on the Wii, one of my favorite Wii games. I love Man Wii, but back to the story. The next season, Hillis only played in 10 games and rushed for 587 yards, less than half of what he made the year before. He never ran for over 1,000 yards, and Cleveland cut him after the season. Some might say this is because of the Man and Curse, but I beg to defer. This is a result of Jim Brown for he had sued EA three years previously for having his name and liking in the game. Once a Browns player got on the cover, Jim Brown had to get his revenge by, suing, or by getting them down, not just because he sued, but because they're the Browns. And not just that, but the Browns finished 4-12 that season with Pat Shermer as their head coach. In 2012, Brandon Whedon, our hottest first-round pick, he was supposed to be a big one, Fiesta Bowl winner, and they started off 0-5, and they won 5-11. Pat Shermer was fired after that season, and like many coaches, only given two seasons. Also, to make matters worse, 
The Ravens sent Ray Wilson to retirement with yet another Super Bowl. The year the Ravens honored their weight and beloved donor, Art Motel. It was the second Super Bowl this city should have won. Jim Brown had ripped off Cleveland yet again. Cleveland started off 2013 with a 3-2 record with all the wins came, coming consecutively. But, as we all know, nothing good can happen in Cleveland. They would lose all the games except for one for the rest of the season. They went 4-12. Rob Chudzinski was fired after the season, and the Browns were doing bad. However, in 2014, the Browns got Johnny Manziel with a 22nd pick. He was the face of the franchise. He was so exciting. The first freshman to win Heisman and one of the greatest college football quarterbacks of all time. It was Johnny Football. What could possibly go wrong? Well, him getting benched to Brian Hoyer, that's what went wrong for him. First, Brian Hoyer, who was with the Patriots and graduated from St. Ignatius High School, spent some time with the Browns in 2013 and earned a starting position in 2014. And it paid off as the Browns created 28-3 comeback against the Titans. That's right, 28-3 before it was a big deal in the Super Bowl. They went 7-4 and, and at one point held a first place lead in the AFC North for the first time ever. Oh, was it all exciting. And then it all collapsed, just like as one might expect. They lost their last five games. Hoyer looked bad. They had to put in Johnny Manziel. And as we all know, Manziel looked like a complete fool out of himself on the field. 80 yards and two picks against the Bagels. It got so bad that Cotter Shaw was used for the final game. Seven and nine went the Browns and dead last in the AFC North. And as the Browns usually did, they looked abysmal after showing hope. They never caught on fire and finished three and 13. To make even worse matters, Ray Farmer, that guy on the left, was fired after texting Kyle Shanahan play calls because that is not good in the NFL. Manziel was continuing to do worse as everything was just piling up on him and causing him to go into early retirement, playing for the CFL and the short-lived day AF. Mike Penn, that guy in the middle, was fired and just like many coaches, only spent two seasons here. Of all the seasons the Browns had, 2016, was without a doubt the worst one yet. They lost the first game, which turned into the next game. And before you knew it, the Browns lost the first 14 games of the season. They would win one game, all because Josh Lambeau forgot how to kick field goals. Yes, remember that one? He missed two field goals. Had he had known how to kick, we would have gone 0-16. Instead, it was a 1-15 record. and something that I laugh at. Everybody acted as if we won the Super Bowl when the Browns won. Oh, was it sad. Yes, it was. And if Cleveland didn't think Jim Brown was continuing curse of Browns, the next season had to convince everybody. The Browns surprised their fans by keeping Hugh Jackson as the head coach, even though he was terrible the year before. And it was a gosh-awful decision. Deshaun Kaiser was the main quarterback and he did so by looking like a high school freshman. Even so, a high school freshman would have done better. Kaiser had terrible 2,894 yards, 11 touchdowns, and 22 INTs, which led all of the NFL. Nobody had over 1,000 yards rushing, and nobody had 500 yards receiving. The Browns had finished with a horrendous 0-16 record. The team was so bad. Words just can't describe how terrible this team was. The Browns became the second team to have an 0 16 season, and they had so many opportunities to win, but they didn't, didn't, didn't. Also, Doug Peterson was now the head coach of the Eagles and led them to a Super Bowl. And that was the first out of three consecutive postseason appearances with the Eagles, doing so with Carson Wentz, Nick Foles, and Josh McCown. Hmm, Josh McCown, huh? Granted, he did struggle last Sunday, but the fact that he was on a playoff team may attribute to the curse because now he's on a good team. And he did help Philadelphia hang in it. 
In 2018, the Browns start off with a below average 2-6-1 record. However, it looked like things were going well. They were making the right decisions. Greg Williams was the interim head coach. Hugh Jackson was finally out of here. Baker Mayfield was a quarterback. Nick Chubb was a running back. Jarvis Landry was a receiver. The Browns caught on fire with a five of their next six games with wins over the Bengals, Falcons, Panthers, and Broncos. If the Browns beat the Ravens, the Steelers lost. And if the Colts and Titans tied, and if Buffalo beat Miami, by all these godly miracles, the Browns would win the division. They hung in it with the Ravens, 26 to 24. Baker marched the Browns to the 39-yard line, where they faced fourth and 10. Rather than deciding to kick it, they decided to go for it, and Mayfield was picked off. The Ravens won the game and the division. Oh, it was frustrating as all anything. The season ended abruptly, but the Browns still had a lot to be excited for. With Greg Williams saying to the Jets, Freddie Kitchens, the former offensive coordinator, became the head coach. The Browns made the biggest move of the offseason by trade Jabril Peppers to the Giants for Odell Beckham Jr. The defense or the offense was loaded with Baker, an head coach he could trust and was good friends with. The defense had Miles Garrett, Joe Schobert, Mac Wilson, Denzel Ward, Sheldon Richardson. Just to name a few, experts thought the Browns were easily going to win the division for the first time ever since the four division era and possibly win the Super Bowl. For the first time in nearly 30 years, the Browns were given hope. They looked like a playoff caliber team. Even I, on this show, if you remember a few months ago, I had us going 10 and 6 winning the division, Freddie being coach of the year, and Baker winning MVP. It seemed like nothing could possibly stop the Browns now. Nothing. Nobody could curse them. Not even Jim Brown could do a thing about this, right? Wrong. It's a great season. This season was the worst season I've ever seen out of the Browns, the most disappointing I've ever felt as a Browns fan. The Browns start off 2-2 two two with a win over the Ravens, who would lose only two games, but then it all crashed and burned. Cleveland lost four consecutive games with three of those teams making the playoffs, the other one being the Broncos. They win their next three games, where all of them came with a price. The Browns barely beat the Bills 19-16, and only because Steven Houska forgot how to kick field goals, Caroline Stash Lambeau. And then the next week against the Steelers, it looked really good. Yet, it's one of the most infamous moments in Browns history. And the ironic part is that the Browns won. They easily won. They kicked Pittsburgh round and around and around. Baker threw for two touchdowns and rushed for one. They were 14 seconds away as the defense stood strong twice, one to seven game. And then Mason Rudolph threw a flat pass, which was taken down and was taken down shortly after by Miles Garrett. Macy Ruff was not happy with it and began to kick and shove Miles Garrett. So then, for revenge, Miles Garrett took everything to the extreme and way too far. Rather than try to get out of it or shove him a little back, instead, he took off Mason Ruff's helmet and swung it at him. One of the most infamous moments in Brown's history. Something that is just known as the Miles Garrett to now. Oh boy. He got suspended justly for the rest of the season, and it only makes sense because if he hit Rudolph any harder, he would have been hurt or killed. A concussion for sure. It will forever overshadow Miles Garrett, who has so far had a successful season, but people will forever remember him for that. After being the Dolphins next week, they will play Pittsburgh at Heinz Field for a rematch of the Big Brawl. Also, Freddie Kitchens was seen in downtown Pittsburgh. And that shirt, I don't know, I think it says Pittsburgh started it. Yeah, that's referring to the brawl that happened on Thursday night. And then Cleveland took a 10-0 lead in Heinz Field, looking that they were the good guys. And then Pittsburgh scored 20 consecutive points, and the score became 20-13. The incredible part was that the Steelers were doing this with their third straight quarterback, Devlin Duck Hodges. And then the Browns having an opportunity to get something going, an interception by Baker Mayfield to Joe Hayden, a former Cleveland Brown, sealed the deal. 
With that, the Browns season was over. Their confidence was drained, and the players were out of reach. Not just that, but Freddie Kitchens made a fool out of himself. Well, the Browns have had so many terrible coaches, which is pretty much everybody in their 21-year history. Nobody comes close to that idiot on your screen on the right. You might be thinking, what the new Jackson wars? What about Rod Jadzinski, Chris Palmer, Eric Manzini, Pat Shermer? Well, the difference between those coaches and Freddie Simple. Hugh, Palmer, Rob, and Pat, and Mangini, they had no talent. Zero talent. Instead of not having a good team for Freddie, he had a playoff Super Bowl caliber team. They had higher Super Bowl odds than the Ravens, 49ers, Texans, and Bills. All those teams made the playoffs this year. Beckham and Landry are two of the best receivers in the league. Chubb was up there for the league leading in rushing yards this season. But rather than that great team, we're talking about stupid coach with no discipline and wasted talent. I talked about this three weeks ago. But if there was anybody else coaching the Browns, they would have had one of the best offenses and defenses in the league. Enough discipline in which Miles Garrett would never ripped off the helmet and swung it at Mason. And the team would be heavyweight favorites for the Super Bowl. Not the Ravens, not the Patriots who wore out, not the Chiefs, not the Texans, the Browns, the Cleveland Browns. This team was ruined and wasted by Freddie, and thank goodness he's fired, and thank God John Dorsey's also fired. How? How can you call this all just a sheer coincidence? And by the way, that diagram on your screen goes up to 2015. It depicts all the disastrous coaches and quarterbacks and stuff that the Browns have had in their history. Jim Brown retiring from the NFL did not signal the end of an era. It was Jim Brown. It was Jim Brown placing a curse on us, saying we will never win an NFL championship or Super Bowl again. What happened next was the Browns choking in the 60s, struggling in the 70s, choking again in the 80s, leaving their one cities in the 90s, and doing bad since 1999. Had Jim Brown never retired in 1965, they would have gone to some of the first few Super Bowls with Jim Brown's running back. And it continued. 1980 would have been the year we made the Super Bowl with Brian Seifer, the Cardiac Kids. The late 80s, we would have beat Denver at least once. We would have won Super Bowl at least once. And not to mention, the immense popularity of the Browns would be so big that the Browns would not be having to deal with a bunch of money. Art Modell would be a great person. He would never have moved Baltimore. He would have never been a big fool and a clown. That means... The Browns will have won the Super Bowl in 2000, 2012 with two of the greatest defenses of all time. They will have the best team in the NFL right now with Lamar Jackson as the quarterback. That's right, Lamar Jackson, one of the greatest hybrid quarterbacks of all time, will he got the victory. We would not be spitting on Art Modell's grave, but thanking him for having more Super Bowls than the Patriots and Steelers. We would still be the New York Yankees of football. There would be no quarterback jersey. There would be excitement and happiness throughout Cleveland. Bill Belichick would be the head coach of the Browns, and Nick Saban would be his defensive coordinator. Imagine if the greatest coach of all time and the greatest college football coach of all time, and they had the same team together. Imagine that. And they had one of the greatest defenses ever. Maybe Spurgeon Wood would be Tom Brady because Bill Belichick could tell him what to do. The Patriots would be such a loaded team, and Alabama would be the dynasty it is. But instead of all this, instead of all this, Jim Brown did not allow this to happen. It is the curse of Jim Brown. Not a coincidence. He was fed up with what our motel had done to the Browns, forgave them when they moved to Baltimore, and by allowing them to be a great team. And the rivalry with the Steelers grew and grew and grew bigger than what it was a long time ago because unlike back when the Browns played the Steelers in which one team's good and one team is bad, both teams are good. Once he learned the Browns were getting another football team and they decided to worship Brown, 
He cursed them. He cursed them by making the Browns losers for over 20 years. He would curse those who worked with the Browns and forgave those who left to try to redeem themselves. The amount of people who left Cleveland and became winners is insane. And the amount of people who saw their careers die in Cleveland is also insane. Jim Brown's retiring was a butterfly effect. It wasn't just a butterfly effect. It was a curse. It was a curse. That's right. You can just tell. Or Modell wouldn't be a Potter-like guy. He'd be a great person. We would love him. We would love him so much. Oh, man, it's it just going Browns and what's all Cleveland. If you remember 52 years, 52 years of losing and frustration happened with the Browns, or not just the Browns, but the entire city until the Cavs finally beat the Warriors three games to one. Finally, it happened. But the Browns, the Browns are still cursed. They are the most cursed team. It's not the football gods. It is Jim Brown. It is the curse of Jim Brown. Sure, one may find this as a great coincidence, but when one legend retires and team hasn't won as a result after him, I think not.